So if we say Iran has been the historical place uh, that gave birth to dimorphic societies, let's see what is remaining of them right now. In this slide I've borrowed the yin and yang diagram to show the balance that used to exist between the nomadic and sedentary elements in a dimorphic society in Iran and how this balance has been lost throughout the modernization period shown in the simple temporal line diagram at the bottom of the slide. This historical line shows how the project of building a central state, a nation state in Iran, has, in between the two revolutions, the constitutional revolution and the Islamic revolution, has affected the nomadic way of life and the balance in the dimorphic societies in Iran. From direct uh, sedentarization policies by force to land reforms to coup d'etats and continuation of these policies after Islamic Republic of uh, Iran have all negatively affected this balance. And while we see that uh, the absolute numbers of nomads in Iran has stayed the same, but the number of sedentary people has grown exponentially, or cancerous growth as we may call it, ending in what we see here, that the nomadic territories are being occupied by urban development, industrial growth, and uh, land grabbing. And what is happening here we call the process between ourselves the Palestinization of nomadic territories. Because what is left of them nowadays is the dark green areas. And streets are, the roads and highways are cutting them, urban sprawl, military grounds, industrial grounds, all are biting chunks off these nomadic territories and their integrity is being really threatened. Same thing that's happening in Palestine. And uh, this also shows diagrammatic, diagrammatically the diamorphic society, how it used all these dog bones, summering grounds, and uh, yes, normally in the north, wintering grounds in the south. For example, in terms of the Qashqai tribes this, that I used to work with, this went up to 100, 700 kilometers. For some tribes, it was much less. For the Sangisaris, it would be even up to 1,000 kilometers. This is just to give you an approximate scale. And in between, there used to be uh, villages, cities, and all these dog bones somehow were interlaced with sedentary settlements. But, <coughs> What has happened now when this balance has been lost is that comparing to the old dimorphic diagram of striated and soft spaces, nowadays the striated space is dominating the soft spaces. This is my imagination of what's happening right now, the space we are living in in Iran, let's say, in Tehran. The nomadic spirit is still there, but it has to go underground. When a certain wrinkle happens or a tear happens in the striated space. For example, during the latest elections in Iran, we saw the striated space is disturbed somehow. Examples? Uh, it exists in the virtual space on Facebook via email. It exists within houses, which we call the underground space in Tehran nowadays, which is away from surveillance of the central government. And uh, it exists outside the territories that they can really control the soft spaces. And if anything out of ordinary happens, when there is an eclipse, for example, you see things happening that more belong to the nomadic way of existence rather than the sedentary. And now I'm looking at the global scale. <clears throat> I'm looking at the transnational migration as 
a force that can create possibilities for the soft spaces to surface again. What do we mean? If these are different striated spaces of uh, different systems, let's say different countries, different cities, different states, in abstract terms, transnational migration creates those fissures, those uh, wrinkles, those tears that can carry soft spaces and allow them to surface as we showed and those splinter tribes in between can move back and forth between these private spaces and find a certain amount of freedom to practice their kind of insurgence of getting away from surveillance and also at the same time using the benefits that concept of conflict and coexistence is of the dynamic structure is becoming globalized, what I'm saying. Can you explain these soft spaces a bit more? Soft spaces, if we go back again to that idea when I was explaining, is where nomads inhabit. It's the space that they create and recreate, and it's the space that somehow threatens and undermines the authority of the space, uh, of the state, sorry. What it means, let's say, as an example, China and Mongolians on the side. I go back again, like the Rosengotari, to the pure nomads definition to be able to make it more clear. The wall was somehow <coughs> built in between these two societies because soft spaces wanted to occupy the city, the state boundary, and the striated space of the city where rules and regulations and taxation and monitoring was dominant, wanted to somehow define itself within a certain boundary, not only to defend itself against the nomads, but also to stop its own people to flee there whenever uh, taxation or forced uh, military service would make it a bit more attractive for people to go to nomadic ground. So these soft spaces, if you want more explanation, it's in those postmodern terms. Uh, it doesn't have those coordinates that you can easily define if somebody moves from point A to point B, you can follow that person, you can monitor. In other terms, the soft spaces are spaces that are made with the fading lines. There are no points in soft spaces. Yeah. Everything is in uh, a constant state of becoming. You can also call it temporary in certain ways. What's happening in the global scale is uh, now uh, coming a bit closer to reality from those abstract terms. This is uh, the idea of the network of globally linked cities according to some structural explanations of uh, what's happening nowadays around the world like Saskia Assassin and others. New York, London, Tokyo are in the core, the diagram on the left, and Miami, Toronto, Frankfurt, Zurich are in the second concentric zone. And the further you go, Sao Paulo is uh, controlling the finance and the economy of Latin America somehow. And Miami is important because it's controlling Latin America. This is uh, what is happening here in this network of globally linked cities. Dubai, for example, that your project is on, is in probably the third concept zone. They've named 40 cities that are linked to one another and they are controlling the global capital system of finance. Service economies are based there. There are lots of indicators, important hubs for uh, transport, airports, and finance, basically. So these are, in uh, theory, growing a network and getting linked to one another. It's like, going back to our discussion of striated and soft spaces, it's like different separate striated spaces that we had before are now, through this network, getting linked to one another and trying to occupy as much as possible uh, the soft spaces and striating the whole world. This is again very much in line with your Constance situation. Yeah, right.
But again, those rabbit holes of transnational migration might create uh, possibilities for the soft spaces to create those wrinkles, fissures, these <coughs> rabbit holes, uh, like Alice in Wonderland rabbit holes. You connect different space times to one another. Connecting these striated spaces to each other and transferring uh, people, money, goods, globalization is all about that. But it not only expands striated spaces, at the same time there is a totally opposite thing happening in my belief that is undermining the global expansion of striated spaces. This is also uh, comparable to what nomads used to do in the past, which is very relevant for us in looking at the case study I have here now. Of Iranians nowadays, the transnational uh, mobile people of Iran, who are using survival strategies that are somehow similar to old nomads of Iran, especially in dimorphic societies where nomadism and sedentarism used to live with one another. How does this mobility, it's not only about mobility, but how does this mobility affect the authority of the state? Going back to those, that idea of core and periphery, the network of global cities, Tehran is somehow a bit far into the periphery, and my agents move going closer to the core and further back. It's like stepping into the capitalist world and stepping out. It is very much like the nomadic strategy of the past, where, for example, we had lots of tribes around Iran entering the uh, empire of the uh, Ottomans. And whenever the Ottomans wanted to catch them, they would fall back into the empire of the Iranian Empire of the Safavid time or a different period. This was a strategy for them to get away from things or when Mongolians invaded Iran, they would again move, not only crossing borders, but mobility is basically a survival strategy for them. But more than that, I'm studying other uh, strategies of my agents here. So from those structural points of view, I'm here uh, talking to 27 Iranian transnational migrants in my research and trying to find out what strategies they have for their own survival, moving in between the state of Iran and the other states that they visit in their transnational mobility. They use their networks of friends and family, their significant others. It is quite important and here we can see those dots are showing their friends and family that they have identified as the most important in their network. And their mobility is somehow following their uh, network of significant others. And possibly the existence of those people also follows their mobility. The thickness of the lines uh, that box them and show their stay in different places also shows another strategy that they try to acquire different citizenships and uh, residence permits to be able to keep their mobility, and the mobility is also helping that. 